Well, uh, we are continuing our series this morning, My Crazy Family, and uh, my name is Mark. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, we're so excited to have you here today. And uh, before we jump into things, a couple things I want to cover. Uh, first of all, I heard that uh, Pastor Seth did a great job last week, yeah. They're helpful for you guys, all right? It's cool, cool. And thank you guys, because whenever, you know, you uh, afford honor to uh, our pastors when they're uh, speaking the same honor that you afford to me, it helps them to become uh, the pastors that they can be, just like I am a product of the honor that you guys have afforded to me. So thank you so much for your support uh, of them. And um, uh, also, uh, at the end of your outline, you have a list of resources. I always... Um, try to put resources there, especially when I'm dealing with topics that, I've, that may bring things up so that you can go further uh, in those. Uh, we've got Right Now Media on there, which you saw the video on at the beginning of the service. Um, but I also uh, want you to add a resource that is not listed there. Last night, we saw War Room in uh, here. It was amazing. It was amazing. And... Let me just say this. I am not a fan of Christian movies. I never watch Christian movies. That's probably the first Christian movie I have seen, I don't know, 15 years, uh, something like that. And, uh, but I was blown away. I mean, it is a funny movie. It's got some great tools in there. And when we got done with that movie, I looked at my wife and I said, every married couple that are believers ought to get a hold of this movie because there are so many tools in there, so many insights that I was just like, man, this thing is powerful. So let me encourage you to put War Room on the list of resources. And, 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 and if you're a married couple, uh, there are actually War Room groups starting up right now because of that movie. And feel free to jump in. And by, matter of fact, you don't have to be married to jump into one. Uh, anybody can get in. But uh, that's a resource that I really want you to uh, be able to take advantage of. Powerful, powerful uh, resource. Um, and before we jump into things, I want to take a moment. One of the things that's fun for us to do is to pray for, for what God is doing in other churches. And um, uh, probably about a month, month and a half ago, we prayed for uh, Pastor Curtis Forbes and Kings River Church. And uh, they had gone to two services in their rented facility. Their facility is too small for two years now, Pastor Curtis has been asking God to lead them into a, a different facility, and that has happened. So, and it's so cool now. Now, uh, you guys are the first ones for me to be able to share the location because I had to wait until his services were done because they're just disclosing it uh, to their people today. But it's over on 43rd Street uh, next to the church at Bradenton, uh, Church of Christ building there where I was baptized and my wife were baptized. Um, they have an arrangement now where they're going to be able to move in there. So we're pumped for those guys. I mean, that is really awesome. And so let's take a moment, guys, and let's thank God for answering that prayer. That's huge. And... Uh, and, and, and let's, just, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and, and thank him. Father, thank you so much for answering that prayer on behalf of Kings River Church, Lord. And I love the way that, Lord, you bring the good news of, 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 of Jesus through Kings River and through Pastor Curtis, Lord, the good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins completely, that you love in for, to forgive people, you delight in that, you love to come into people's lives with the power of your spirit and to change lives, and Lord, the way that it comes through Pastor Curtis and through his people is just so cool, and so we thank you, Lord, for the way that you responded to their prayers, and we ask you to make your name great there through them in that community, thank you for the church at Bradenton and their partnership uh, with Pastor Curtis. We want you to bless them too, God, because of this. And Lord, we just delight in what you're doing in our community. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, listen, as um, we continue um, this series, My Crazy Family, if you remember in the very beginning of the series, uh, we've talked about the fact that that there's the, the relationships which are ideal to us, and then there's what's real, right? There's the what we want to see in relationships, and there's what the reality is. And the gap between what's real and what's ideal, um, there exists something called tension. 
And if you remember, we talked, about, we talked about it this way, that how you manage the tension determines the direction of your relationships. What you learn and how you deal with the tension that you experience between what's real and what's ideal matters a great deal. And it's much bigger even than the relationship itself. Listen, how you learn to manage the tension in your relationships, not only determines the direction of the relationship, it determines the direction of your character. It determines the kind of person that you're becoming. And at the very core of the message that Jesus gave to us was a call that, where Jesus said, anyone who wants to follow me must take up his cross and deny himself. Which means that at the core of the Christian message and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is a willingness to change a willingness to allow God to, 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 to put to death as you cooperate with him. Those toxic patterns, those, those attitudes, those ways of behaving in your relationship that actually hurt your relationship. And to be open to allowing God to put in you the kind of character that it requires to be able to have a relationship that thrives. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he said, You know how people are going to know that you're my follower? By the way that you love. That's how they're going to know. And, and we all start in that place where we come into our relationships based on what we've seen modeled by our parents or didn't see modeled by our parents. And we start in a pretty broken place. And then because of the fact that we've chosen to follow Christ and to take up our cross, we allow him to change us and to change us and to change us so that we begin, we begin to look more and more like Jesus in the way that we love. That's what the Christian life looks like. And today, it doesn't matter whether you're married or whether you're married again, or you're single, or you're single again. The principles that we talk about today will apply in every area, especially in the area of marriage, but these are things that help you to manage conflict and man manage tension no matter what the relationship is. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of things today, and let me just, let me just say this right up front. For some of you, as we talk about some real practical uh, ways of managing conflict and we establish, hey, don't do these things and watch out for these things, we're going to talk about two things, um, kind of some basic ground rules for how to fight fair in your relationship, and we're also going to talk about signs that you might need help that goes beyond uh, what happens here today. That's why that resource list is there. But as we talk about these things, you may find yourself going, oh my goodness, I've already blown it. Oh my goodness, I, I, you know, and, and you begin to feel condemnation. Do not let yourself get under condemnation. When you hear something today where you realize, oh my goodness, that's an area that, where I have blown it, you own it, you confess it, and you thank God that now you know what to do differently. Okay, You build upon what it is that you learn today. Don't let yourself get under condemnation, condemnation because of it. And I want to start out today kind of framing this whole thing with something that uh, James wrote in the book of James, uh, starting in chapter 1. And let's read this out loud together, okay? Would you do that? James says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. doesn't produce the character that God desires. And I love what he says. He says, understand this. In other words, be intentional. Be aware. Don't just do what you saw your parents do. Don't just do what comes naturally. Think about how you're having a relationship. Think about how you're managing the tension. Because if you just give in to your natural anger, that's not going to produce the character that God wants to produce in you. And so we have a choice in everything that we talk about today. In every decision we make, we're either making room for God to work or we're making room for the devil to work. And we've got to become aware and we've got to be intentional. Because that will determine not only the direction of our relationships, but it determines the direction of our character. And so I'm going to kind of give you um, eight uh, real simple rules that are kind of like, how do you fight fair? How do you work through conflict? Number one is this, no name calling. 
No name calling. Ephesians 4.29, the apostle wrote this. Don't use foul or abusive language. When you use foul and abusive language, you've got to think about who you're making room for in that situation. Are you making room for the devil to work in your relationship? Or are you making room for God to work in your relationship? It matters. And it matters because there, oftentimes there are children present. And if you can imagine that, that in the future your children are talking to a counselor and trying to work through some, some things in their lives, that one of the first things that counselor is going to ask is, tell me what it was like growing up in your home. What are your children going to say? And so you've got to be, you've got to get away from the name calling. If you've blown it in this area, do what my wife and I did. We've blown it in this area. We took our kids when they were, when they were young and we had really gone at it. And I said things about her and to her and at her and she said things back at me. And, and what we did was when we knew that we were coming to a point of resolution, we brought the boys into the room. Here's a, now, here's what we did. And maybe we're weird, but we made a decision early on that we were going to fight in front of the kids, but we were going to resolve it in front of the kids because we wanted them to know it was okay for two adults not to be able to get along, and it doesn't mean that they're breaking up. We wanted them to see how to be able to resolve things. And so we called the boys into the room, and I looked at the boys, and I said, boys, there were things that I said to your mom that were unloving and unkind, and I want you to forgive me for saying this, this, and this to your mom. I said, will you forgive me? The boy said, yes. I looked at Maria and I said, honey, would you forgive me for the way that I spoke to you, so unloving and so unkind, when I said this, this, and this? And she said, I forgive you. She did the same thing. She said, boys, you heard me say these things to your dad. Would you forgive me for the way that I dishonored your dad? They said, yes, mom. She looked at me. She said, would you forgive me? I said, yes. And we made up right there. And we let the boy see it. So, you can, so you've got to clear the air. There are ways of, of allowing the grace of God to come in and to heal situations. Now, there is some name calling that's okay. Uh, snuggums, that's okay. <laughs> Buttercup, you can use that one. Uh, schmoopy, 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 right? You can use that one. Uh, Captain Sexy Pants, that's okay, right? Now... Is that oversharing when I tell you what my wife calls me? I don't, is that wrong? Okay, well, she's the only one that gets to call me that, okay? So just, we'll just say that there. So, no name calling. Okay, number two. Don't yell. Don't yell. No yelling. And listen, that's like a hard one, right? You might start there, but you don't want to make that a part of how you relate. Look at what Proverbs 29, 11 says. Fools give full vent to their anger, but the wise bring calm in the end. But the, the wise bring calm. Say, the wise bring calm. The wise bring calm. That's what wise people do. But you might, you might be going, oh, yo soy Latino, es mi sangre. To my blood. <laughs> but we're Italians. This is what we do. Or I'm a hot blooded American. I'm sorry. Okay? So, what does a wise Latino do? A wise Latino brings calm. What does a wise Italian do? A wise Italian brings calm. What does a, a wise hot blooded American do? A wise hot blooded American brings calm. And see, we want to be people of wisdom. We want to be intentional. We want to think about how we express ourselves. So whatever you have to do, go for a walk. Tell God, I need your help because I'm really mad. Or count to 10 or 10,000 in some of your situations, right? Count to 10,000. Or, or go watch you know, the dog whisperer, Caesar Milan, and learn not to inject negative energy into the situation. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, you've got to get yourself under control. And don't yell. You don't want to create that kind of environment. You want to be able to have an environment where God can really work. Be the wise person. A wise person brings calm. Here's the third one. Don't get historical. Some of you go, you spelled hysterical wrong. No, I didn't. No, 
Don't bring up the past. You talk about the issue at hand. You don't go, yeah, this is just like what you did back then and back then. And back. You, know, you don't do that. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Does Jesus keep record of your wrongs? No, he doesn't. Matter of fact, the scripture says it. He says, your sins I remember no more. I don't keep a record of your wrongs. Then who are you to keep a record of somebody else's wrongs? If you and I are going to love like Jesus, and people are going to see him in us, then we've got to learn sometimes to just let some things go and to forgive and to not keep that record of wrongs in us anymore. I knew, I knew one time I was, I was, I was with a guy, and, and, and he's holding his cell phone like this, and his wife is yelling at him on the phone, and she's talking about something that happened 30 years ago that honestly was not a real big deal, but for 30 years he's been apologizing. He was apologizing then, and she was still yelling at him. And I'm like, don't you, know, don't you realize what you're doing? You're like giving me great sermon material. You don't want to give me great <laughs> sermon material like that because I'm going to talk about it. You, you, so what we got to do is we got to learn to, to let things go. We've got to be like Jesus and keep no record of wrongs. Here's the fourth one, really important. Avoid the words always and never. You always leave your socks on the floor. You never help around here. See, those are, those are such loaded words that automatically a person can't resolve things like that. That's, that's just picking a fight. So what you have to do is, is you have to say it in a way that when you've got something of the reality and you've got what's ideal and you want to move in that direction, but if you say always and never, it doesn't get there. You have to learn how to say it like this, something like this. I feel so alone in keeping this house in order when you throw your socks on the floor and never pick them up. I just feel alone in that. And what you're doing is, is you're now expressing a desire and you're saying, look, there's a gap between what's real and what's ideal. Can we move towards the ideal together? Can we do this? And when somebody comes to you, your, your spouse says, hey, th when, when, you know, this is how I feel when you do that. Let me tell you what's happening. What they're doing is in that moment, they're giving you the key to their heart. They're offering something to you that was hard for them to say the way that they said it. You can, at that moment, go, you're just exaggerating. You're a drama queen. Or you're just a jerk. Or I do my fair share around here. You can choose to defend. You can, you can choose to, 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 to stay stuck in a certain pattern of thinking. But when somebody is offering you the key to their heart, let me give you a little moment of coaching here. Here's what you do. You suck it up. And you just meet the desire of their heart no matter what, and you watch what happens. You die to the person you were, and you let God express his love. When you do that, somebody knows how much you value them and how much you value their heart. And they're giving you an opportunity to do that. So saying it in a way that your spouse can understand it really matters. Hey, I feel like this when you do that, I would like things to be better. Can we do that? That's a huge, huge thing. So avoid always and never. Here's number five. Never use the D word. Do not introduce the word divorce into your arguments. Don't threaten to go with the thermonuclear option when there's tension in your relationship. That is, when you plant that seed, that is so poisonous to being able to resolve things. And what happens is, is you give an opportunity for the devil to take that word and begin to infuse all kinds of thoughts in you and in your spouse. Not only that, but even if you work through the issue, even if you work through it and it's like, oh, we're okay now. If you have children in the home, if they've heard you use that word, their sense of security is now undermined, even if you resolved it. And so if you've done that, the thing to do is to get with your kids and say, you heard dad use this word or you heard mom use this word. We don't believe in that. It's never going to happen. Forgive me for using that word. And you've got to let the grace of God come in and just wipe that thing clean. Don't use the D word. That is a manipulative, 
tool that is very, very dangerous. Number six, no taking off rings. Well, I don't feel married today. I'm mad. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So is this like a barometer of how you feel? So it's like, oh, I feel half married today, so I'm going to wear my ring like that. Or, yeah, I'm not feeling very married. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear my ring like this today. Is it like, oh, this is a barometer of my feelings, so today I don't feel married, and, and today I feel married? That's not how it's supposed to work. Listen, this is a powerful symbol. This matters. This ring matters. It's a matter of honor. And, and how you manage the conflict, it determines the direction of your character. And when you refuse to play the games of, well, I'm taking it off today because I'm mad, and I'm going to put it on the next day because now I feel better, listen, you've got to instead choose to be a person of honor. Why does a follower of Christ refuse to take off their ring? Because I made a vow before God, that's why. And it matters because this is the kind of person that God has created me to be, a person of honor. And so I'm not going to allow my feelings to dictate whether or not this ring stays on or off. I made a vow, and I plan on keeping it. And I'm not going to play any games with this thing. It's a matter of I'm going to honor my wife, even though right now I don't like her. But I'm going to honor her because it's the kind of person that God created me to be. And it matters. It matters because I want to honor my design that God created me to be a person of honor. So I'm not going to take off my ring. It's not a matter of my feelings. This represents a commitment that I made, and I'm going to trust God to lead me through it. So you don't take off your rings. You keep them on. Here's another one. You fight, but you fight for resolution. You understand that whenever you have conflict in your marriage, you already know what the goal is. The goal is resolution, not to win, it's resolution. It's that we get to that place where we know that we have worked things out. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians 4. He said, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. How you manage a conflict either makes room for the devil to work or it makes room for God to work. He says if you let anger go unresolved, you're now just creating all kinds of room for the enemy to do something to undermine your relationship. And some people take this passage very literally. They literally will not go to sleep until they've worked things out. That, that as a couple, they said, we will always resolve things before we go to bed. Some people have made that commitment because they take it so seriously. For, you know, and I'm not going to go and act like I'm sleeping when I'm really stewing and thinking about how mad I am. No, let's work it out ahead of time. Now, I don't think that there's anything wrong with if you're really tired as a couple to say, we're both at our worst, let's get a good night's sleep, and let's resolve this in the morning. Can we do that? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But no matter what, it's saying, I'm not going to just let this thing simmer. And by the way, resolution doesn't mean we're not fighting. A lot of people just take the issue and sweep it under the rug. And it stays there and it lives there. It doesn't go away. And just because you're not fighting, it doesn't mean that there isn't anger and tension in your relationship you want to resolve it. How do you know that you've resolved it? Well, if you look at the book of Job, you'll read the story of, of a man who, who uh, went through a lot of difficulties, and a lot of friends, friends surrounded him and basically said, yeah, the reason you have so many problems is because of the sin in your life. And all through the book of Job, he kept hearing the same thing again. He gets to the end. When you get to the end of the book of Job, you'll discover that God is ready now to restore and to bless Job, but he does it only under one condition. You know what that condition was? That Job blesses his friends. How do you know that you've reached resolution with your spouse? Because all that lives inside of you is a desire for blessing for them. You know that it's resolved when there's not an ounce of anything in you except, God, I just want you to bless my spouse. Thank you for them. That's how you know it's resolved. That's how you know you got there. So you fight, but you fight for resolution. Number eight, pray and listen to the Holy Spirit. 
You say, how do you pray? How do you listen to the Holy Spirit? Here's how you pray. God, help me to be a better husband. God, help me to be a better wife. And then you listen to your conscience, and God will guide you through it, and you obey what is in your conscience to do. And sometimes that means you're going to be able to set aside your selfish pride. You're going to be able to, to apologize. You're going to be able to, uh, to go in a different direction because God will lead you. Look at Colossians 3.15. The Apostle Paul wrote this, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let God's peace guide you. Let that be your umpire. So God, help me to be a better husband, help me to be a better wife, and then follow your conscience. That is number eight. You don't have nine listed there. I'm just going to tell you what number nine is. No quoting your pastor when you fight. Leave me out of it. You got yourself in that mess. Don't make me a part of that. You're on your own. Unless you got a good story to share with me, I'll always take that. Listen, Ruth Bell Graham said this, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Isn't that good? It's a, it's a union of two good forgivers. Now, John Gottman is a psychologist who has, who has done some amazing research, very well recognized in um, the uh, community of, uh, of counseling. And what he's been able to do is to determine that there are four behaviors that if you see these things or these kind of characterize your uh, relationship, that those are such big red flags that you probably need to get help beyond what we're going to talk about here. That's why you've got those, that resource list there. I've got counselors listed for you on there as well. His research is so thorough and so well recognized that what they found is, is that if these four things are evident in a relationship, it is a very high predictor of marriages that aren't going to make it. And it, all it takes is five to ten minutes and they can determine whether or not a marriage has good chances or is going to really uh, not be able to make it if nothing changes. What are those red flags? He calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Number one is this, criticizing. There's a difference between criticism and complaining. Complaining is what we talked about number four above. Complaining is this, I feel alone when you leave your socks on the floor. It's okay to complain. It's okay to say, I want things to be better there are things in our relationship that I think that would, can really uh, make things better if, if we're willing to change this, if you're willing to change this. Complaining is okay because it shows that you care and that your relationship matters. Criticizing is different. Criticizing is, why can't you be like your brother? How come you're like your mother? Criticism now moves from behavior to attacking the person, attacking their motives. You don't love me. That's what's going on here. Criticism is something that can't be resolved necessarily by a change in behavior because it's an attitude that a person has chosen to adopt, a general disposition of how they look at the other person, and it's deadly. Here's the second one, contempt. Contempt, a deep-seated resentment towards the other person. And by the way, there's a big nonverbal sign that shows contentment, and it's this. The eye roll. Seriously, when the eye roll is, is something that you do a lot towards somebody, what that's, what that's showing is, is that deep down inside, there's resentment and contempt inside of you. But listen to what John Gottman wrote. He found that if partners display contempt toward each other, which commonly includes making sarcastic remarks, their odds of divorce rise dramatically. People who use sarcasm don't see themselves as being hurtful, they see themselves as being funny, but recipients tend to interpret their remarks as hurtful. Why? Listen to this. Sarcasm is hostility disguised as humor. And it comes out in the way that you talk about your spouse, whether they're there or not, the kind of stories that you tell, it reveals whether or not you uh, have contempt in your heart for them. Here's the third one, defensiveness. Defensiveness is a person who never, ever takes responsibility for the challenges that facing the relationship. They don't look at it as we're in this together. They're like, that's your problem. 
A person who's defensive never, never says that, that I'm at fault for something. It's always put on you. I'm sorry. And they might say I'm sorry, but it's like this. I'm sorry I did that, but you did this. Which is a way of saying I'm not sorry. It's I, I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't have done this. I'm not responsible. I refuse to take responsibility for this. I'll put it all on you. You're a drama queen or you're a jerk. That's your problem. That's why we have these things. And defensiveness is always shifting blame to somebody else. Let me tell you how to break out of this. If you have been a person that has had a hard time accepting responsibility, you've probably never said these words before and you need to learn them. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? When we hurt people by accident, I'm sorry is okay. But when I've intentionally done something to hurt you or to hurt the relationship, I'm sorry does not work. You have to say, will you forgive me? And you've got to break through it. You've got to, you've got to let go of the defensiveness. Here's the fourth one, stonewalling. Stonewalling doesn't just mean I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to tell you now's not the right time. Well, when's the right time? Never, right? Stonewalling doesn't just mean I get in my car and I drive off and I, you know, I stay away for hours at a time. Sto that is stonewalling. But the other form of stonewalling is this. Though, sure, I'll have a conversation. Let's go ahead and talk about it. And when we talk about it, just when we begin to get down to the issue, I change the subject. And just when we're about to resolve that one, I change the subject again, and I learn to bob and weave. Serpentine, right? Learn to serpentine, bob and weave. And what I do is I just learn to change the subject when we're getting close to resolution or it's becoming a little too real, and I'll just shift it so that we never resolve anything. Stonewalling is a way of saying, I'm not interested in resolving our problems. And when you have those four things, you need to get help. You need to find out, why do I compartmentalize my faith? Why is it that I, I expect God to bless me, but I tell him, don't tell me how to treat my spouse? Why is it that I can justify being so mean and hard when I'm saying I belong to Jesus? God, I need your help. And you might look at these things and go, man, I don't know that there's any help, hope for our relationship. Well, there is. I can tell you that. We've been through it. My wife and I and so many people in this room can tell you there's all kinds of hope if you're willing to let God do a work in your heart. When Jesus looked around, he said this in Matthew 19. He said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, what? Everything. Everything is possible. There have been people that have been married over 50 years, over 40 years. We're in 30 years this year for us. People are people. The issues are the same. You, you, you apply what God says and you leave room in your heart and God will make things work in you if you're willing to do it. People are people. But sometimes what happens is, is that people compartmentalize and they say, God I don't want you working in this area of my life. But to be a follower of Christ, you've got to say, God, there's a part of me that just has locked you out. I'm so sorry for the way I've treated my spouse. Help me, God. I need your help. For some of you, maybe you've never just surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never just let him come in to your life. All of it, just all of it. And and let him forgive you. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He, he wants to give you his Holy Spirit so you can experience transformation. He's for you. But you've got to trust him. And maybe right where you are, today is the day when finally you settle the issue of your relationship with him. I'm going to pray for you first. After that, I'm going to pray for those of you that maybe you feel like you're right in the middle of it. Maybe you walked in here mad today already. I want to give you an opportunity after we pray the first prayer for you to just take the hand of the person that you love and let God become the center of your relationship. I just want to take this moment. Let's pray. If you've never trusted Christ, never opened up your life to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, right now is the, is the time to settle that issue. 
And right where we are, you can just say to God something like this, if this is the expression of your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I need you to change me. I've done so many things to hurt my life and hurt the people I love. And I've got to die to all that stuff. And so, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I know that you paid for my sin. And I invite you to come into my life by the power of your Holy Spirit and to teach me to love like you do. From this day forward, you're my Savior and you're my Lord and I'm yours. And if you're a Christian couple and you've hit some hard spots, it'd be a good time to take the hand of of your spouse. And if you're willing to let God do a work in your relationship, why don't you both just invite Christ to become the center? And you can say something like this. God, forgive us. The way that we've treated each other, attitudes that we've had God it's been unhealthy it's been wrong we need your help so Lord we confess our sin to you and we ask you to come in a fresh way into the center of our marriage and for you to expand our capacity to love and for you to display your kindness and your forgiveness and your grace in us. We want people to see what it looks like when you're at the center. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we just thank you so much for your grace and your wisdom, your passion and your desire for us to experience relationships in the greatest, most fulfilling sense And Lord, that you desire to create in us the kind of character that you created us to possess and to walk in. So Lord, do a great work in all of us, in all of our lives, Lord. And whether it's someone who's single or single again or married or married again, God, may you bring your grace and your wisdom through all of us, not only for ourselves, but to be able to encourage people around us. And Lord, we thank you and we trust you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Oh, God, thanks, guys. Amen, Lord. Thanks.